So thank you for joining us this morning for our talk. Uh, we'll be sharing about a project that we're currently doing in Uganda in collaboration with the International Organization for Migration, in which we are working with point of entry screeners, as well as other personnel at the border crossings between the DRC and Uganda for Ebola preparedness efforts. We'll provide a little bit of background and context on Ebola right now in, the, in Uganda, as well as the impacts that it has um, coming over from the DRC, some of the current challenges that are recognized with the flow of information and available data, and then we'll talk a little bit about our current approach as HOT, um, in which we engage the communities to take part in the um, Ebola preparedness efforts and the use of open source tools, as well as a very uh, unique approach to uh, continuous support. We'll talk a little bit about the successes, some challenges, and looking forward. Um, disclaimer, we might use a bit of lingo throughout, so if we say EVD, it means Ebola. And anything else, if it's not common knowledge or understanding, please just shout out and we'll explain. Feel free to be as interactive as you want. All right. Thank you, Sarah. So uh, a brief introduction or background of Ebola in Uganda. I Uganda had the first case, uh, the first confirmed case confirmed by the Ministry of Health was in June 2019. The patient was a young boy, five years old, who was traveling from DRC from a funeral of his grandfather who had just died of Ebola. Since this since June, uh, the government and the ministry have employed different partners who are going to be helping in the response. And this framework is going to be used to make sure that the points of entry are more resilient and we can be able to screen everyone that is coming in and going out of Uganda and to curb the EVD. Thank you. Ooh, wrong computer. Okay, so there are a number of Ebola preparedness efforts that are currently taking place in Uganda. You have the National Task Force that was put together by the WHO, um, supporting the Ministry of Health, and that consists of a large body that's currently coordinating the efforts, as well as a number of other subcommittees, uh, which consists of surveillance, contact management, case management, um, and uh, a few other subcommittees who are managing the coordination. Um, you also have partner organizations such as the Uganda Red Cross Society, which is playing a pivotal role in the health screening that's taking place at the border crossings. And you have a number of other efforts such as frontline and health workers being vaccinated in high-risk areas, as well as new Ebola treatment units um, being set up in high-risk districts such as Kasese District, where that first Ebola case came into Uganda. There's also a number of efforts around community education and risk communication. And then we get to the last point. And so in these meetings, these um, national task force meetings and other coordination meetings, a conversation that continues to come up is what is the role of information management in border health management? And so we were approached by IOM a few months ago um, about this idea to take a paper-based form that they're currently using uh, to assess um, the various uh, stock and materials that exist at the various points of entry. Um, and so in addition to assessing like what materials are available um, at the points of entry, it's also touching lightly on the flow of people. How many people on average are passing through each of these crossings on a weekly and monthly basis? What other personnel are available and on site to respond to any needs on any given week? And then, you know, we're, we're, we're talking a little bit more about you know, what's missing from the larger Ebola preparedness framework when we're talking about information management. The current use of paper-based forms it limits the effectiveness of 
conducting gaps in needs assessments. So by the time that a form is actually filled out by a um, district analyst, who is a person that's responsible for X amount of points of entry in any districts, where previously, before HOT came in and started doing this work with IOM, you had these district analysts taking a form on a week or monthly basis, visiting each of these points of entry, filling out the paper-based forms, then providing that information to a digitizer or someone who's sitting at a central office recording this information into a central system and then having that information be sent to the Ministry of Health central server where that data is analyzed and you have you know, response actors who kind of come in and say, oh, we need more chlorine here, we need more people attending to this point of entry, etc. As mentioned, there's a lack of information flow between the POEs and the Ministry of Health central responders because of the fact that you're losing a lot of time digitizing the form, translating that information to an electronic file, and getting that to the people who are making decisions about what is needed where. There's also little understanding of where the greatest needs are. So we'll talk a little bit about this later on in the talk, but currently in the four, er in the four districts that we are working in, in Western Uganda, there are six formally recognized points of entry. As you'll hear later on in the, in, the, in the talk, we ended up finding around 115 points of entry that are informal uh, to uh, IOM, but also of value because this is a part of actually understanding where are the needs. And another thing is in the villages that are boarding the DRC, specifically in these areas that we're talking about, there's very little to none granular spatial data um, that could potentially support more systematic contact tracing in these communities in case there is a suspect case. So, HOTS approach. This is where the collaboration came in between HOTS and IOM in support with support from the UN Central Emergency Response Fund, which essentially funds a UN agency during the onset of an emergency or disaster. So we had these conversations with the IOM and we came up with a few objectives. How can we reduce the lag time between how information is recorded and sent to the MOH for central responders to better assess where the needs are? We wanted to ensure that this was going to be a sustainable process, so who should be doing that data collection and actual assessments, instead of having the district data analyst come in who does their weekly and monthly rounds, we trained the point of entry screeners as well as the focal persons who are each based at these points of entry to use an ODK form, which became the digital information tool, to assess where the needs and gaps are on a regular basis. Talking a bit about the lack of spatial infrastructure in these villages bordering the DRC, we set out to create and generate this infrastructure data and along with the communities that actually live there. And last but not least, we, we carved out a major part of the program to kind of focus on how do we ensure that the POE personnel who would be filling out the weekly and monthly assessment forms would be able to continue to do so once HOT leaves the project. What does that authentic learning and like sustained engagement actually look like? Thank you, Sarah. So, this, this next slide. Okay, so Sarah has mentioned the different objectives that we are trying to achieve in this project. I'm going to take us through each of them and how we achieved them. So to digitize, to provide a digital information tool. The information tool we're talking about here is an ODK form that could be deployed on the focal people's, focal personnel's phones, which they could then carry out these assessments manually. The paper-based form that we digitized was the land point of entry assessment tool, which had over 210 questions. These questions collect information on how many people are coming in on a daily basis, what are the peak hours of entry of travelers, how many, what is the available EVD stock that the point of entry has, which, uh, which, if, which IPC uh, measures are being employed at the points of entry. By IPC, I mean information, sorry, infection prevention and control measures that are employed by the points of entry screeners 
These could be hand washing points before you screen someone or a line distance to separate the screeners from the travelers to avoid further infection. So to be able to use this tool, we had to train the personnel on how to actually fill out a digital paper form, sorry, a digital form. And these are personnel that had never done this before. Before it was their supervisors who are the DAs that Sarah mentioned that would do the assessment, come to these POEs. And now with this tool, we were trying to bring down the, we're trying to reduce the information gap by bringing down the form to the people who are actually on ground. So we were able to, the personnel had to be able to communicate these resource gaps to the national task force and also to help to create a first, a first feedback loop which will be able to ad address the different such gaps. And this was also to help strengthen the response in making sure that Information is coming in in real time from the people on ground to the ones at the head offices in Kampala. So this is what uh, the form looks like. We broke it down into three separate parts. We have a weekly assessment, a monthly assessment, and just a testing for learning purposes. We applied skip logics in the form to, to ensure that someone doesn't have, it's 210 questions. So some questions are getting information that can be used to analyze the POEs on a monthly basis. Other questions are vital to get daily information, also weekly, to make sure that you're capturing the information timely. And the other option was to allow for the POE personnel to practice how to use this tool. It was a new tool to them and wanted to make sure that we get quality data. So this allowed us to separate the different information that we're gathering. So I mentioned the different questions. Uh, in the middle we have, what are the main types of flow? We need to find out our travelers who are coming in. Why are they coming in? Which, what brings them to Uganda? Is it, are they traveling for trade? Is it cross-border populations? People who are just mainly staying around like on the other end of the border and the side? And then, and the different screening forms that are being used. So, to make sure that this was going to be taken up, taken up by the personnel, we had to train them, had vigorous trainings in all the four districts that we were operating. This is Rukunjiri, Rukunjiri Rubirizi, uh, Kanungu, and, and Kisoro. So, we trained uh, all the personnel that were deployed at the different points of entry in these districts on how to use ODK, how to download the forms from the server, how do they send a form, and how do they carry out the assessment. Sarah mentioned that we needed to create, uh, we needed to create a map that shows the different infrastructure that is, a, that is at these POEs and the border communities. So we had, uh, we had remote mapping campaigns where people, we had over 430 volunteers, some of you probably are in the room, that helped contribute to digitizing the different buildings and roads that were on ground. Further, from these campaigns, we were able to map over 28,000 buildings and over 144 kilometers of road. So these base maps are used in cases of contact tracing. In case, for instance, if we do have a case in, uh, say, Kisoro, with these responders can be can be responders can easily trace, uh, say, like where the patient first came in, who are they in contact with, where do they go to thereafter. So we also, to build further on these, uh, on these infrastructure maps that we made, we had the community itself that is on ground, the border communities, collecting different points of interest like the health facilities, the water points, the education, and all other amenities that could possibly attract travelers who are coming into Uganda. We trained the local communities uh, in, this, in these areas this also, helped people, this also helped us gain better understanding of the amenities that are on ground and what could possibly, possibly, 
be attracting the people to come in. Then this can also be used to support public health measures. For instance, I mentioned the contact tracing earlier. These are some of the photos of the people on ground picking. That's people collecting data on a water point, and that was one of our team members showing people how they could use OSM and to track themselves as they're moving around the villages. Okay, so we talked a little bit about what that project consisted of activity-wise, and we just wanted to share a few of our metrics. So 90, 90 people, and this includes local government officials at the district levels that we were working with, the IOM data analysts, as well as point of entry personnel, were trained in the use and implementation of the information management tool. Um, over 1,900 points of interest, and that's, as Shamila mentioned, health facilities, schools, um, wash points, mobile money shops, were all mapped by the local community members who live in those villages bordering the DRC. Out of the four districts that our project focused on, as mentioned, there's six formally recognized points of entry that IOM officially recognizes we were able to map and find 110 additional informal points of entry. And this data is extremely useful as it's going to inform IOM in better allocating um, various resources such as um, hand washing uh, stations or personnel based on the number of people who are crossing into those areas on a weekly and monthly basis. And uh, last but not least, um, by digitizing the paper-based form to a digital tool, we've been able to increase the number of assessment forms that are regularly coming into the central server on a weekly and monthly basis. So here is just a sample map of focusing on one of the villages that are bordering uh, a lake. Uh, in the DRC, um, where we show here the facilities and one of the parishes um, that were collected by the communities themselves. So we have three informal points of entry, as well as some schools, mobile money shops, public markets, um, and no health facilities, actually, yes. which is very interesting. So we wanted to make sure that this project is sustainable, so we had to make sure that the focal personnel is well equipped and can easily fill out these forms. So we have a support mission which, which involved going back to these points of entry and asking the focal personnel, how are you finding the form? Are there any challenges that you're facing? We are also using this, doing this through uh, WhatsApp channels where we created WhatsApp channels for the different districts and the focal people are able to communicate with each other and share this information. So here is an example of kind of how our coordination efforts have looked. Um, in the middle here, we've got, in the middle and on the right, we've got two WhatsApp groups of kind of how did these weekly assessments come in on a weekly basis. Seems like a very simple concept, but for people who have never used their phone, their WhatsApp to kind of like use for work, it's, it's quite, you know, tedious for them in some sense. And there's a, quite a bit of follow-up that happens. But the reason for this is once HOT leaves, you want to make sure that they're still continuing to upload these forms and to really understand what the value of this type of stuff is. So there is these WhatsApp channels that were set up to not only regularly check in with the POE screeners and focal persons who are conducting the assessment, but also to provide technical support. Say on any given week you have issues with like using the form, there's a way for them to very quickly ask questions to our team based in Kampala, and we could very, very quickly step in and provide some advice. On the left-hand side, we also have a general POE assessment group where, as mentioned, it's really nice for the people who are doing this sort of work up on the ground in the communities to to regularly receive updates on what's actually going on. It makes them feel engaged and informed about what's going on and that their role actually matters. Thank you, sir. So some of the data being collected uh, is being fed into the displacement truck monitor, the DTM of IOM. So here we can see how they're tracking the number of people coming in and the number of people that are going out and the totals the total that are received during that day. We can also see the different demographics of how, like, which gender is traveling the most, their nationality, where are they coming from. And on the other side, we can see for the different points of entry that we have in Uganda, this data can be used to analyze the, 
who came in? Is it the refugee settlement? Where are they coming in from? Which direction? Which places in Congo are they coming in from? And where are they settling in? Okay, then uh, we also mentioned that the people on ground, the community that we used to do the community mapping was also involved in picking some of the informal points of entry. So when I say informal, the, you need to understand that the border with DRC is a very porous border. So you have the formal points of entry, which are the known points of entry, the normal border points. But then people also create, uh, in the local is panya, which means a path where people can pass in informally, can get in informally. So our, the mappers on ground were able to pick some of these points, and I'm going to just share with you the interactive map of these points. And, and just to add, while that's being pulled up, ooh, that's hard. Does PDF. So that means to let? Sorry. Any Germans around? This? OK. Thank you. And, and so just to say, <laughs> so, so it's not that the community members who were doing this data collection were just choosing to map whatever point of entry they thought. It was relying on the community leaders who were in each of those sub-counties who would actually inform us of, hey, this is a point of entry that is not formally recognized, but we know X amount of people are pro crossing over here on any given week. So it is the community members who, in collaboration with the village leaders, would go to those POEs and actually do the assessment. Okay, thank you, Sarah. So the green points that we are seeing are the formal points of entry that are known legally by IOM. And then the blue points of entry are informal points of entry, but known informal points of entry, if that makes sense. So these are known, and that, that means they have set up focal personnel that are manning these points of entry and screening travelers. So the orange are the ones that were picked by the local people on ground. Like, yeah, we know you have a point over there, but some people pass here and they do not get screened. So this also draws attention into what is the definition of a point of entry for, for different people. IOM might say maybe over, if you're crossing like 20 people, sir, 20 people a day is a formal point of entry. And then the community says no. I think even if it's like one person or two that are crossing, this is a point of entry and we need to create a screening point that is there. So this is, this is covering all the, the different districts that we surveyed in the western part of Uganda. You can also see a better contest of the Uganda and the DRC border. Oh, sorry. Uh, all right. Awesome. Cool. And so just kind of wrapping up this, uh, this talk, um, with any project, there are some challenges. Um, as Chami mentioned, the extreme nature of the porous border makes it very difficult for IOM as well as other part partner organizations to prioritize um, which points of entry should be prioritized over others. And that has to do with a number of things. And currently, as we speak, it is the points of entry that are considered priority that are part of the high-risk district. So that is, for example, Kasasa district, where we've had a number of Ebola cases kind of come through. Another challenge has been, I guess, more on the operation side, insecurity. So in the areas that we were working in Western Uganda, some of those areas were known for regular kidnapping. So you have an NGO that's kind of coming in with expats or people who are working from Kampala, who are, you know, word gets around and the kidnapping commonly happens. So something that we had to consider in a lot of our um, operation plans as well as like putting together our security plans. And as always, one of the challenges is lack of secure funding. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with kind of what's going on with the Ebola preparedness framework in Uganda, but unlike our partners or unlike our neighbors in the DRC, Uganda is not considered Ebola, in an Ebola response. What that means is not, of, not a lot of money will come into Uganda at this time, which makes work like this very, very difficult to scale up because unless you are in a response, the money is not necessarily coming in, which makes preparedness efforts a bit less tangible. So looking forward, um, you know, we wrapped up, we're actually wrapping up this project right now. We're submitting some deliverables today. And so really, to be honest, to assess 
we need to assess the use of this data on a longer scale to really um, understand its full potential, and that will hopefully give us a better use case for why this needs to be scaled up for a number of reasons. Better contact tracing, better prioritization of resources, um, and really assess addressing needs and gaps at various points of entry. And, um, you know, it is really valuable to be able to scale up such a program because you'll not really realize its full of potential until you're able to see kind of the impact that it has on the number of people that are coming through and how those preparedness efforts can really be realized. Yes, uh, maybe just to add what Sarah said, uh, we are bordering DRC and over 20, we have 22 districts that are high risk districts and this project was only done in four. So there is need, if we need to see how the partners are responding to the data and possible cases of scaling up, like Sarah said. And that's it. Thank you. No questions? Uh, so thank you, Sarah and Shami, for your great presentation and great talk as well. Uh, you are doing a great job starting from uh, building capacity to local people and mapping the real situation on the ground. So thank you, guys. Uh, if you have any questions, Sarah and Shami are here. They can answer you. I'm happy to chat more outside yeah. with Shami. No